Thanks, John. Um, it was nice of you to cite uh, a period that's actually turned out the way I've said, because in my career, I've said many things that didn't turn out. So your, your selective picking was uh, quite nice. Look, um, I, I did say all that, and I, I would just say that a number of things happened since then, uh, some which didn't surprise me, some which did. Um, A, the inflation was actually a little higher than I thought it would be, although I thought it was going to be above 6%, which at this time seemed quite radical. Um, B, the bubble has really burst with a vengeance a lot more than you can see in the S&P. A lot of very good companies um, have been derated 60-70% without a whole lot of change in fundamentals. So valuations have improved relative they were. And then C, I'd say the biggest surprise since I talked last spring was how slow the Fed was to recognize the problem. I thought they were slow not recognizing it last in April of 21, but they were still buying bonds in March of 22, and they were still not even pivoting verbally until November. I think that period was incredibly costly because a lot of assets, uh, a lot of assets were purchased during that period that I think a lot of people moving out the risk curve will lose a lot of money on. I would just say, where are we now? It, it's hard to believe given the extent of the monetary policy the last 10 or 11 years, I think globally we had 30 trillion of QE. Um, even as late as I think a year ago, there was 18 trillion of debt that was still negative yielding when the world was about to experience 8% inflation, it's pretty, it's pretty extraordinary. So it's hard for me to believe you could have unwound all that that created in terms of a misallocation of resources in six months. So my best guess, and um, this business is about guessing, there are no certainties, is that we're six months into a bear market that has some room to run uh, for those tactically trading, it's possible the first leg of that has ended. Um, but I think it's highly, highly probable that the bear market has a ways to run. Is it going to be a soft landing or a hard landing? Well, the answer is I don't know, but the probabilities of it being a soft landing are pretty remote, John. Um, Historically, I think we've only pulled off two or three in history. The one I lived through and remember so well was the 94, 95 one, but we've never had a soft landing after inflation's gotten above four and a half percent. And the situation we face now is extraordinary where the Fed, um, where are we these days? I guess we're at 75 basis points. I can't keep up, but even the projections of 2% you're so far behind the inflation rate and there's so much wood to chop and there's been such a broad asset bubble going into it. Um, it's very hard for me to say that the probabilities favor a soft landing. Indeed, I think they aggressively point to a hard landing. Anything's possible. As I said earlier, I've been wrong plenty of times in my career, but betting on a soft landing to me is a real is a real long shot. So you think once inflation goes above 5%, it's very hard to tame us in a way that's elegant. Well, that's what history says. It's there, There's an interesting historical fact, which in fact I think is going to be violated, but two undefeated records are number one, once inflation gets above 5%, it's never come down unless uh, Fed funds have gotten above the CPI well, since the CPI is eight, that would call for a Fed funds rate of above eight. Frankly, I don't think we'll get there because the extent of the asset bubble and the damage that would be done. Think about the fact that we have virtually no bankruptcies and look at this, probably the most disruptive period um, since the 1890s. Uh, I don't need to tell a founder of Stripe that. <laughs> 
Um, but if you look across the landscape, there should have been many, many, many bankruptcies, which have been varied by QE. So if in fact, Fed funds ever got to 8%, which by the way, I don't think is going to happen, um, the destruction would be quite material. The other the other statistical fact is once, in, once inflation's got above 5%, to use your word, it's never been tamed without a recession. So if you're predicting a soft landing, you're going against decades of history. Could happen, anything's possible, but I don't think it's probable. No, I think those um, historical examples are uh, quite sobering. Was it you said that once inflation goes above 5%, it has never come back down without the Fed funds rate going above the CPI? Yes, and the yeah, CPI that, that, is currently eight year over year. Um, I actually think we are gonna violate history and it is going to come down I don't know how far, but without that happening, the second one, I think history is going to win. That's once inflation gets about 5%. It's never come down without a recession. And I think a recession is in the cards. I just don't know when. We have about, depending on who you listen to, a trillion and a half to two trillion of excess savings now. So it may take some time to work through that savings. But given the extent of the asset bubble and the destruction in the markets, given what's going on in Ukraine, given zero COVID policy in China, um, I don't take a lot of comfort from that. So I assume, um, and I'm pretty strongly assume we're going to have a recession sometime in 23. I just don't know whether it's going to be in the early part or the later part. And again, um, it's a guess. It's not a fact. As we talk about what's going on in the market, uh, uh, or sorry, in the economy and not the market, you know, one thing I find really interesting about your style is people like to trot out the phrase, you know, the stock market is not the economy. But uh, you have, you know, been on the record a number of times talking about how you use the stock market as a signal for what's going on in the market, uh, in the economy. And so, you know, you have this distributed team. If you look at all the, you know, stock analysts out there uh, covering all these different stocks and all these different uh, sectors, they're kind of like the, you know, engineer in the cockpit of the train. And, you know, when the, uh, you know, dial starts flashing and, you know, it's a sign that you can investigate more. So I'd love you to talk about this approach where you are using movements in stock prices to decide or to, to, to know that, hmm, something's going on there. Maybe I should go investigate. Yeah. I, uh... One of the ironies of my style, maybe it's because I was a dropout um, of a PhD program in economics at the University of Michigan, is that I don't use what traditional economists use to predict the economy, which is things like um, employment and a bunch of macro top-down statistics. In fact, I started my career as a bank and a chemical analyst, and over time I learned that the inside of the stock market had a very, very prescient message about future economic activity. And for whatever reason, stocks tend to lead the fundamentals by somewhere between six and 12 months. And you can even go beyond that and look at industries that lead the economy and industries that lag the economy. The obvious one that everyone knows about is housing has traditionally been looked at as a leading in this industry. Retail has a slight lead, capital goods lag. And what we've done historically is actually, even though you refer to me as a macro investor and many people have, is we do the macro by a comp compilation of listening to companies and doing a bottoms up analysis of companies that lead the economy and, com and I'm sorry, industries that lead the economy and industries that lag the economy. And if the leading industries are turning up or turning down, that's a signal. And that's worked beautifully historically. The other signal, which I have found quite prescient from markets, is the bond market. Um, unfortunately, the last 10 or 11 years, the bond market has not signaled anything because the central banks took it upon themselves to manipulate bond prices, which to me, is the 10 year treasury has sort of been the most important price in the world. And they took that price out of the equation as a signaler. I remember last summer when certain forecasters had a different forecast than my own, 
kept talking about, well, the bond market is saying this, the bond market is saying that when the 10 year dropped all the way from 170 to 115, which by the way, I did not anticipate, but the bond market wasn't saying anything. What was going on is central banks were buying trillions of dollars and manipulating the price of bonds. So there was no signal. I don't think you get that tainting if you look inside the stock market. You could get it in the stock market as a whole, but if you do this approach where you look at industries and you which lead, which lag, and you put the puzzle together, it's been pressing over time and it's certainly allowed us to consistently the last 20 or 30 years outperform the Fed in terms of economic forecasts. I find that really interesting, uh, you know, equities acting as kind of this synthesized predictors for certain industries. And so say, if you think about understanding what's going on in housing, again, the economy now, what kind of concretely, what will you be looking at? Is it publicly traded REITs? Is it, uh, you know, uh, the stocks of construction companies? What does that process look like for you? Well, there, there's, you don't need to get real fancy here. You can just do the home builders themselves. And uh, with supposed good fundamentals, they've all declined 50% from the high. Another industry that's been incredibly prescient has been trucking. Um, and they're down 40% from the high, despite the fact that they're all reporting record earnings. Um, an industry that is not that much of a leader, but it's more of a leader than a laggard is the retail industry. And there's been a lot in the news lately, whether it's Walmart or other companies um, retail. That one's a little tainted. You just can't take these things blindly, John. That one's a little tainted now because in COVID, retail went to 100% of the wallet from about 85% because we weren't going outside and traveling and going to football games. But even taking that into account, um, retail appears to be much weaker than it should be given what the so-called GDP numbers are printing. So right now there's a there's a signal, albeit early, that um, there may be trouble ahead. Yeah. So you look at trucking stocks being um, uh, you know down fifty percent, and you say, hmm, okay, this probably doesn't you know does not bode well for trucking volumes. It kind of has to be the case. Yeah. And if, if it was just trucks, fine. But it's not just trucks. It's housing. It's retail. It's all over yeah. the place. And by the way, you can't get too carried away and say that means we're going to have a recession tomorrow morning. So a lot of these things have longer lead times, like six months to a year. Yes. One thing you're also getting at here, kind of when you reference that you used to be able to look at the bond market and kind of now you can't, is it seems um, very true that the investors who perform really well over uh, multiple decades have to shift stylistically over time and become new kinds of investors. I kind of love the stories of, uh, you know, the, the value investors back in the day, where if you look at what Ben Graham was actually doing, you're hunting for companies where the, uh, you know, book value is greater than the market cap of the company. It was a famous, you know, case of Northern Pipeline where they were trading at $65 a share and they just had $95 a share of stuff and railroad bonds or whatever on their balance sheet. And he bought a bunch of their stock and then just yelled at them and complained until they finally dividended out $95 a share of their assets. But that doesn't work anymore, obviously. You know, markets have gotten a lot more efficient and you can't just buy companies that own more assets than their market cap. So value investing has to change. And similarly, you're describing here, especially, you know, the relationships with bonds, the relationships with currencies have to change. And so I'm curious, can you talk a bit more about how you stylistically have had to change the, the tools in your toolkit? That's really an excellent question. And um, it's very, it's, it's right on point because when I got in the business, um, you could almost guarantee if a company reported lousy earnings open down that day and close up big, that stock market was going to be higher six months from then and vice versa. You could almost always guarantee if the economy looked great and bonds were rallying, that meant the economy was not going to look so great. We used to call it price action versus news. And it used to be an incredible indicator of security prices, partly because of the efficiency, partly because I think the growth of hedge funds, we all learned these rules, um, and partly because of central bank manipulation. Price versus news is a very weakened tool versus 20 years ago. 
much to my chagrin <laughs> because I always found it a great warning signal. And now a lot of times it may be warning of nothing or warning of something that doesn't exist. So that's been um, one thing I've had to adopt to. I mean, frankly, when I started in the business, I'm showing my age here, which was the mid seventies, um, I started in equities. And I also learned, particularly in bear markets, that I had to morph into bonds, into commodities, into foreign currencies, things like that. I mean, one of the most challenging things for me right now is maybe it says something about my dysfunctional personality, but I've always made even higher returns in bear markets and bull markets. But the way I did it was just pretty much ignore equities, take them off the table, buy bonds, buy treasuries and go home. Well, I've never present, been presented a cocktail where you have 8% inflation, you think the economy might weaken and bond yields 3%. It's an analog with no precedent in history. So for the golfers out there, going into the situation we're describing, I feel like I'm about to play a round of golf without a driver and without a 60 degree wedge because bonds, which have been my go-to asset in terms of, of a recessionary bear market atmosphere, they may work, but there's a good reason to believe things may be different this time because we've never had central banks with situation in Europe, for example, we have negative rates with 8% inflation, or even here, we've never had anything like this. So you always, you can't get into black and white that it's an art form investing in from cycle to cycle, you have to constantly innovate and not just be a slave to past models. So how are you positioning the fund given that, you know, maybe you don't feel so good about going long equities, but your normal bond toolkit uh, is not working uh, quite well is, uh, you know, is the golf thing top of mind because, uh, you know, it's actually hard to, you know, to do too much uh, or uh, how are you positioning things? Well, currently I'm very challenged. Um, we were lucky enough to have made some money uh, up until now the last six or eight months primarily by having a, a, let me call it a matrix of short fixed income, short stocks, and not doing a whole lot in currencies and owning uh, some of the key commodities, particularly oil and mistakenly uh, gold, but copper.